Thank you to the organizers for organizing this um, session for putting quarries and rock sites on the agenda. And you've heard a lot about um, the sites and the, the quarries uh, up till now, uh, but as my title says, it's not all about the quarries. Um, and with quarries, I am talking today about stone and bronze age uh, quarries or open cast mines that you can find in the uh, southern half of Norway. So, when I read the abstract for this session, I sympathized with the notion of regarding caves and quarries as knots in networks. And I like the image of these sites serving as doorways for interaction between humans and the mineral world, as places of exchange and symbiotic relationships. The physicality of the quarries, the unchanging rock and mountains, the persistence of a scarred rock face, and large waste piles of loosened blocks, used hammer stones, flakes, and blanks, they give some quarries a monumental character. The persisting traces made quarries into tangible proof of the activity of their past generations, and perhaps even ancestors. Especially in, for example, the Norwegian Mesolithic and Neolithic, where humanly made stone structures are rare. Such endurance, then, must have made an impact on people's understanding of time past. So I could not agree more with your abstract. However, I do not think that all quarries had such impact or glorious significance. How do we differentiate? Where a scale of extraction, remote location, or time depth of activity may impress and induce a sense of the site being extraordinary, scale is not necessarily that which made a site significant. Some sources of rock are small, they are limited, they are spontaneously used, or not necessarily even quarried, but most certainly exploited sources in the Stone and Bronze Age. Others are large deposits and sites, but the topography makes it difficult to get an impression of the large-scale exploitation that wants to place there, <coughs> like Cathy was talking about, the ephemeral quarries. So co contrary to the statement that the moulded hollows are the only testimonies of the undertaking quarrying, I would like to emphasize how the products taken away from these quarries are important mementos and testimonies of the quarries too, as well as the act of quarrying. To investigate distribution patterns can therefore be a method of uncovering the status of a quarry too. Sometimes we find traces of persisting regional distribution like here on the west coast of South Norway. And the green there is the distribution of greenstone. The blue is a particular kind of diabase. And rock from two large Stone Age quarries were used to make ground adzes throughout about 4,000 years. The rock were persistently distributed across these two large regions, indicating an embedded regional desire for rock from these particular quarries. And this, even if similar rock types were equally available and suitable and also used in the same regions. So the mere access to rock from these quarries, to possess rock from the sites, could then be a display of social affinity, testifying to someone's claims to land or territory. And the endurance and scale of exploitation and persisting wide distribution, it's of a scale that implies that these sites may over time have become mythical. But once more, the significance of every quarry should not be reduced to a question of scale. So how do we determine whether a site had any significance beyond pragmatic aspects such as availability or high quality raw material, if not through scale of extraction? One solution is to contextualize the quarries and to compare the manner of exploitation and distribution of rock from several sources. To look at what were done at the quarries and beyond. Around 4000 BC, the first external impulses from farming societies start to appear in the archaeological record in Norway. At this point in time, a new, a new large quarry was established atop a sugar top mountain called Sigyo. And this source was in, intensely exploited in the first half of the Neolithic for about 1500 years. And the rock was distributed even wider than the greenstone that I showed, and it's also shown there to the right. In fact, the establishment of this quarry marks the Neolithic transition on the west coast of South Norway. At some sites, up to 90% of the lithic assemblages are made out of rhyolite. Not too far from Sigil, 
two cross, uh, Jasper quarries were, were in use too. So Jasper and the SIG Uriolite was used to make the same type of blade and flake tools as also flint was. The quarry's location at the shore makes them both more accessible than the quarry atop of Sigu, and one would think they would be easy to exploit. However, examinations of the lithic assemblages at settlement sites in their vicinity show that rock was actually used very limitedly. Jasper makes only out 2% or less at most sites, and the distribution was really local. Moreover, the use of this beautiful red rock was outnumbered by rhyolite, but also by beach flint, quartz and quartzites. So with regard to jasper, people in the area quarried it, even if they did not really need to, yet they did. Does this limited use signal that jasper was even more valuable than the sigu, rhyolite and the, the greenstone? Was it more exclusive or uh, was there uh, embedded another value? Or had by 4000 BC the act of quarrying become important? Had it become part of the inhabitants of this area's habitus and part of the particular group identity and community of practice? At this, and this is the main point of this talk. In order to differentiate between quarry significance and role in society, an approach that moves beyond the quarries themselves is required. My answer is to focus on practice. We can study quarrying, or rather lithic procurement practices, including quarry sites as part of a Chenna Patois. This rendered visible the many choices involved in lithic procurement and the many components that in some have made empowered the practice and the, the quarry and the rock. A fundamental interpretive premise of the Chenna Patois is that a defined group's habits of mind and body are reflected in identified preferences in the execution of different tasks. The methodology thus enables us to identify expressions of cultural or social affinity intertwined in technology and the production of artifacts. Quarrying and preferences in lithic procurement practices represent a specific kind of knowledge, a knowledge that must have its wellsprings in individual experience, yet becomes to large extent conventional in social circles through certain processes, whereby these conventional bodies of knowledge assume their locally characteristic shapes, to quote Frederick Bartsch. Memories, knowledge, and know-how of a social collective are all then tacitly maintained, reaffirmed, and transferred through con uh, continuous performance. So archaeologically, we can study what people did, how they acted, area-specific persisting or changing practices, preferences, and traditions through what they left behind. Through comparing contemporary exploitation of several rock sources, patterns of different differentiated attitudes to rock from various places can emerge. Building on a detailed investigation and comparison of more than 20 quarry sites in South Norway, dating from the Mesolithic to the pre-Roman Iron Age, I divided the operational chain of lithic procurement into seven. For each of these stages, there are many options. And just for you to get an impression of the many possibilities embedded in the practice, I'll go briefly through, through the different stages. The chain starts with the choice of either to quarry or to collect rock including whether someone chose to return to a site through time or not. Modern evaluation of risky or remote locations are set aside and instead the quarry's location in terms of being secluded or not from other types of activity areas are considered. The next stage comprises any necessary preparations before quarrying, such as to make, or, uh, to make and bring dry firewood or collect and bring hammerstones. Choice of quarrying techniques is stage four. Direct hammering, quarrying aided by fire, cold wedging, or in some situations, the exploitation of a source through natural freeze and thaw processes, which leave no identifiable trace on the rock surface beyond the flakes that lie uh, underneath it after preliminary testing of the rock next to it. Then there is the question of waste management. There is initial reduction of blocks, and finally there is a stage seven where one may ask what happened next. Where did the rock end up? How much was distributed? And what did they make with it? And each of these stages will produce a material trace possible to investigate empirically at the quarries, the workshop sites, or at the settlement sites. So my investigations enabled me to distinguish between several types of lithic procurement. First and foremost, between quarrying on the one hand and collecting. But the intensity and endurance of the practice uh, involving quarries and quarrying is regarded. 
like these listed here. And this focus on practice helps us look beyond obvious and inevitable physical and topographical variation. It also enables a comparative approach to quarries and lithic raw material procurement, making it possible to build social arguments based on their results. So investigating quarrying as a verb enables us to transcend the obvious topographical, geological or other properties of a quarry in order to identify if some of the sites were extraordinary. Building also on ideas in assemblage theory, I perceive a quarry as an assemblage, or rather an assembled practice of quarrying, where all actions are constituents or components that combined was what made a quarry significant. The type of exploitation we can detect represent a deliberate choice, living social memories and knowledge of socially accepted traditions and practices. And to again paraphrase Frederick Gotch, making the world meaningful is not rooted in either the material or the cultural worlds, but rather in the activity of people. So this does the totality of the practice, the organization of the task, the sites or practices persistence, a quarry site's material site, as well as its immaterial aspects, which contributed to define the quarry's role in their contemporary societies. This activity and human engagement with the world in general is as always rooted in human knowledge production and are thereby ways of making the world meaningful. And this may sound esoteric, but this process is deeply material. And the social <coughs> entanglement of human practices, preferences and choices created empowered places and it empowered the rock. The quality of the rock may have initiated the exploitation of a source, but lithic procurement would soon have become entangled in people's everyday lives. Philosopher Edward Casey comments on how humans through their sensorium and bodies can note different places sameness because of one's engagement with these places. It is because humans engage and the way we engage with these places that we can regard a place as something more than its physical properties. So if we acknowledge this, we can also argue that some quarries may have, have had extra uh, significance. Some may have functioned at social arenas. Like at this inland quartzite quarry exploited at the end of the Neolithic and in the Bronze Age, a time period that is the transition from hunter-gathering to farming in South Norway. Here, flakes of, of high quality flint was found. And I should here add that flint is not found geologically in uh, Norwegian bedrock. It can be found at the coast as so-called beach flint, that is nodules that were secondary deposited by floating icebergs at the end of the last ice age. So it's a coastal resource, resource. but it's also in the Neolithic or in the Neolithic, they started to import flint from flint-rich areas in southern Scandinavia. So this flint is a valued um, raw material. So, and also this flint, a valued raw material, must have been intentionally brought inland to this region. And this then begs the question, why do you bring flint to a quarry where you have immense uh, raw material already? What happened here? So I'll leave this question open, but to conclude, the assembled practice of quarrying, moving beyond the quarries, including socially situated knowledge and know-how, enable arguments of place which anchored cultural affinities or forged social bonds. Through practices and traditions, we can support arguments which also comprise the emotional, emotional and empowering qualities of quarries and rock that helped elusive concepts into being, enabling ideas and social knowledge to turn corporal and visible. Thank you. <laughs>